give everyone a heads up, uh, Alyssa will be TikToking live um, at some point. Oh, I guess she has her gadgets ready. Um, and okay, uh, let's hit next. Okay, let's Okay, so for the agenda today is um, we have Mio and Alyssa speaking, um, uh, presenting their slides. And then right after that, we'll get right into it. Uh, ask, ask me anything, well, ask her, ask them anything. And, um, and we will have definitely open up the audience for, uh, for that. Um, and then after that, we have a community announcements um, and then closing networking and then a quick survey form. If, you guys can help us out. So without further ado, um, let's have Mio. Hello. Okay. Um, nice Hi. to meet you, everybody. Uh, I'm going to start by sharing my screen. Okay. Um, so I'm the founder. You can see my screen, right? Yeah. Okay, I'm the founder and CEO of Curina, which is a fine art rental subscription service founded in New York in 2019, October. Um, so it's been about a year and a half since we launched. Um, so I'm here to talk about Curina and how I um, basically survived 2020. Um, just to give you a quick intro about myself first, I was born in Japan. I, we moved, my family moved around a lot. So for preschool, I went to North Carolina. I was in North Carolina. Um, I was in Japan for most of uh, preschool and um, um, until I was 11. And I did um, middle school in London, high school in New Jersey, college in Japan. And I worked as a management consultant in Japan for four years. And then I went to Columbia Business for, for MBA in 2017. And that's where I started working on this idea. Um, so just to um, start off, it's easy to understand about this business when I talk about who we target. Um, so basically we target high net worth millennials, otherwise called Henry, high earner, not rich yet. Um, one of our clients is pictured here, Francisco Uribe. He's 35 years old, lives in Chelsea, New York, and three bedroom apartment by himself. Um, he purchased, he wanted to uh, find an artwork about five years ago, went to galleries, art fairs, also browse online on, on Sachi Art, but didn't really feel comfortable paying a few thousand dollars for something that he hasn't seen in person or was not sure he's gonna like forever. Um, so this type of people, they are, very financially and professionally successful, um, but don't necessarily have the asset yet. Um, and he, uh, um, this particular client went to Carnegie Mellon for undergrad, worked at Google, um, sold his own company and now works at an AI venture as a product manager. So he certainly is a, um, capable of purchasing on artwork, but they are, they want to be um, a smart shopper. They want to make smart decisions about um, shopping. Um, so he liked the idea of paying a, a monthly subscription fee of $148 per month. And he decided to purchase this artwork, which is in his background. Um, it costs around $7,000. Um, Sorry, going to the next slide. So our galleries um, system is very intimidating, exclusive. Um, I'm not sure how many of you have been to galleries, but I, I felt that way uh, when I wanted to buy an artwork. And obviously it wasn't a place for me to buy because it was so expensive, but most of the time they're not um, showcasing the artwork price. Even online, um, sometimes you have to request to see the artwork price. Um, not much information to connect with the artist, which is important for someone who's buying on artwork for the first time. Online platforms are often not curated and chaotic. So um, uh, many hurdles for purchasing an artwork. In addition to that, millennials um, nowadays, they're so used to the idea of subscribing and renting. Um, and furniture rental subscriptions are having a moment, definitely. Um, one of the subscription uh, furniture subscription company last year raised 30 million. Uh, Furnish also raised 50 million last year. 
Um, so basically Curina provides customers with affordability, flexibility, and style to discover and try art before purchasing. And so how it works is we curate and sign with artists and galleries and offer their artworks for rental and sale to customers. There are three pricing tiers, 38, 80, and $148 per month, just uh, depending on the price and the size of the artwork. And if you decide to purchase, um, you the rental fees go toward purchasing. In addition to the art rental program, we try to create um, a community of next generation art collectors by um, planning studio visits and gallery tours, um, obviously before COVID. Um, and we also created and distributed artist content, uh, which helps um, the artists to get promoted and get known as well as it has a bit of an education um, element uh, for someone who's trying to buy or like learn about art, how it works in the art industry. Uh, what, it, uh, what Curina artists are saying is that galleries and exhibition often like to have the most recent works in their shows. Um, so they keep accumulating works that they created, for example, a year ago. Um, so they, um, are looking for a platform or a partner to re get represented on, but the more established you are as an artist, the more selective you are um, about which platform to be represented on. So even if you know that you're going to be able to sell artworks, you are, if you're an established artist, you never want to put your works on like eBay or Etsy, uh, because that just degrade your brand as an artist. Um, so we try to balance um, being able to sell your uh, sell the artworks, but at the same time um, maintain as well as elevate their brand as an artist. Um, just quick stats about art market: um, 67 billion global art market. U.S. is the biggest market with 44%, um, and high net worth millennial art market is set to be about 18 billion, and they are the big, um, the fastest growing segment um, that buys the most and spends the most. Um, about Curina, yes, we have about 120 artists so far. 90% um, of them are based in New York right now. Um, so 1,300 artworks um, in our portfolio and we continue to grow our um, offering. Uh, we got some organic and free press last year. Um, these are just some of the, um, we also launched a project to um, contribute to the um, um, to the, um, well, well, so basically we uh, launched a project to um, donate part of our proceeds for healthcare workers to distribute a mask last year. Um, so we are very focused on the nonprofit aspect as well. These are some installation photos um, at clients place. Um, just a quick um, like, um, like intro, like overview of like how I went through uh, since I launched the company. Um, like after I graduated from Columbia, um, it was a lot of like uncertainty and anxiety because I didn't know, I didn't have funding at the time. I didn't really know if it was gonna be successful, um, but uh, I launched the company in 2019, October, and then we were doing great. Sorry about the background noise. Um, getting acquiring customers as well as artists, um, growing two-sided marketplace. Um, but four months in, um, COVID hit and we went in, into lockdown in March last year. Um, so that was rock bottom. And then we started to see that people were um, spending more and more time at home and investing in their own home, first buying desks for office and plans and then art. So we started to see a bit of an uptick um, starting around June. Um, and interestingly, Black Lives Matter uh, really garnered um, interest um, for us because a lot of people were looking for artworks by Black artists, Hispanic artists, and Asian artists. And unlike um, galleries who have been representing white male artists most of the time, we were focused on shedding light to these um, groups of art, talented artists who may not necessarily have representation at galleries. And then um, this year in January, we raised funding for a seed round. Um, 
um, about of about $1 million. And we're trying to grow the, um, the team right now, which is very exciting. And now um, with the funding, I'm very excited. But at the same time, I'm a little nervous with as we enter the next phase of growth. So that's kind of um, the overview of the business model as well as my path to where I am right now. So I'm gonna, I guess I'm gonna pass the torch to Alyssa. Thank you so much. And uh, I love I guess, the last graph. This is really interesting. The truffle star, right? <laughs> it's easy to you know, understand about your company. Love that. Yeah. I like the left side numbers. Yes, <laughs> you have like a zero. That's and amazing. <laughs> can I copy that? Or can I write that right now? All right, um, thank Mio, you. thank you so much for the wonderful presentation. As the same, a Japanese women entrepreneur in US, I I totally understand about this COVID, you know, difficulty, and I really like respect you. And I really like, I appreciate that you passed the information about this Japanese startup community in New York. Without your introduction, I couldn't reach to all of them. So first of all, I really appreciate Mio. Thank you very much. And hi all, my name is Alisa Miki and I'm the co-founder CEO of Kashi Cake. We're doing a business of, we are doing several business and one of the iconic businesses, this Misaki Tokyo. So let me a little bit introduce about myself again. Hi guys, my name is Alisa Miki. I'm a serial entrepreneur uh, selected by Forbes Japan 100 Top Women as the youngest awardee in 2018. And Business Insider Japan also set me as a game changer in 2019. In the past, uh, I done so many variety of business. One of my achievement is uh, a flower shop business. When I was student, I established a, a deer bouquet, uh, which made it in number one in Rakuten. I also have a several shop in Tokyo, and I also did some AI company. So many business, and my last job was in the Japanese education. Uh, programming education co company and I established US franchise and cooperate with Disney. Well, and just in case before explain about, you know, my company, I also wanted to, you know, give you a little information about this picture because a lot of you guys are confused because of the super differences between this picture and me. Thank you so much for the Photoshop. It's actually same person. So, well, please uh, remember both of me. <laughs> so, you know, this picture I use for the Japanese media and in the US, I, you know, as you can see, I dye my hair in orange. So I use like double picture, but like, you know, but well, anyway, <laughs> all right. So, you know, I now you know about my about myself. I'm super funny and I love to talk a lot of jokes, but um, I have a huge dream, two dreams. One is I really want to establish a new Louis Vuitton group to create opportunity for artists. So because my mom, she was an artist and she got a lot of prize, but unfortunately she couldn't make enough money when I was a child. I feel so sad with that. And I also realized that the artist has a wonderful power to create a new stuff, but they mainly don't have the knowledge to do marketing or, you know, financing. So that's why I thought if I could be a wonderful, like, you know, advisor for the artist, that would be a great, uh, I could, I thought I could create a better word. And then second, this is also important for me. This is really big, I know, but I really wanted to create a beautiful future through equality. Well, I am a Asian woman and I'm born in New York and I actually had a lot of, lot of difficulties as a woman in New York. And, but, you know, and also I, I had an experience about the 9-11 terrorism. And so I decided that I want to make society more peaceful so these two dreams i wanted to achieve th these two dreams for my company and then i established a new brand misaki tokyo in uh december 9 2019 so 
my company itself, the history is really like, it's like not long enough. We are, we just have one and a half years uh, history, but I'm very happy to share my company achievement. So Misaki Tokyo, we are providing crystal treats, which are vegan gluten-free known additive sweets made out of seaweed. And the unique, one of the uniqueness is the flavor. We create like hibiscus cranberry flavor, lavender mango, rose, yuzu matcha, so many unique flavors. So it's, we like, we categorize my sweets as a, like a healthy wellness sweet. And I'm very, very surprised and happy to introduce about our Misaki Tokyo's achievement. And one of the significant achievement is the collaboration with Kim Kardashian. And she, you know, we collaborate with her new fragrance last December, and she posts about my uh, sweets as well. That was a huge impact. But not only that, the monthly compare was the, sorry, the, the material is a little bit old, but that uh, compare uh, the compare of the revenue between 2019 and 2020, it become a 20 times bigger than only one year. And our accumulate sales, we reached to 100,000 pieces. And we didn't do any advertisement, but we have 235K follower in TikTok. Our accumulate video views reached to 15 million views. It's all organic. We didn't do any advertisement. But in a re I was surprised, but I'm also happy with these results. So here's a question. Why could we you know, grow quickly in one and a half years? There's one reason that it is true that we're working in a sizable and grossing market, like food and vegan food and you know, gluten-free. Like the, the Kager is about like 20%. So it is true that. It is also true that we have a high needs. For example, how half of the people who practice a vegan or gluten-free diet are not satisfied with the desire. That is true. But our strength is not came from the data. Our strength is our branding, our brand message. Our brand message is we create an equal, equal and peace world. So Misaki actually means beautiful future in Japanese. And we really wanted to create the eco world through our sweets business. To explain about my you know, brand details, before that, I would like to also share about the Japanese sweets history. So uh, the Japanese sweets, we call wagashi, are used in the tea ceremony since the Edo period, that is 400 years ago. In the past, so these sweets were used in the tea ceremony. And also in the word of tea ceremony, samurai were, not, were asked to leave their throws out of the tea room because throws was an icon of the authority. And the people in the tea ceremony uh, society believe that people should be equal. So those, you know, they think that they should not bring any authority in the tea room. We Japanese, has a wonderful, you know, equality philosophy for 400 years. And this crystal treat, we wanted to explain those wonderful philosophy in Americanized way and also the modern way. So that's why our sweets are vegan and gluten-free. So anyone who do vegan diet or not, gluten-free diet not or not can spend the beautiful time together. And also the, you know, the, flavor it came from all of the growth for example hibiscus is from uh mexico lavender is from europe rose is from mediterranean east and africa so once my customer uh bring my sweets to the party they can share the wonderful memorable time together and not only that but also in the business side we also care about the equality for example um it is unusual for the food industrial but we share our recipe to the local restaurant these days to against the COVID because imagine like this COVID is crazy. They cannot get any money. So that's why we share a recipe. And now 20% of our sweets we purchase from them. And we wanted to support those, you know, small business together. 
And in addition to this, we hire women and minorities in our kitchen and teach them not only about the sweet techniques, but also we teach them like marketing or finance or kind of the, those business skills to have their own business in the future. So in this way, we are creating American fair trade structure. And that's why it is, you know, it is really difficult for the small startups creating these American fair trade structure. So my customer, my fans understand and respect me. That's why we are loved by so many fans and so many celebrities. And for Misaki itself, uh, we're, we're going to product, produce so many sweets, Japanese sweets, influenced Japanese sweets. And right now, this, this is a really top secret, but we're going to launch this kind of a cupcake style Japanese sweet. Isn't it beautiful? You can actually eat these flowers and we're going to launch in, we're going to launch in New York as a beginning. So hope you guys are, you're going to enjoy it. But anyway, so, so Misaki itself, we're going to launch so many, you know, variety of the sweets. But as a company, again, I would like to cr create, uh, the lots of opportunity for the craftsman and artists. So that's why our strategy is we are going to create a lot of brands. For example, this year we already launched three brands and one is include with T a T brand. So in this strategy, so Misaki itself is a luxury sweets brand, but uh, we have a great synergy with a T. So once the T, T brand success, we can think that it is easy to you know imagine that we're gonna you know launch a new tableware brand and once a tableware brand is success where we can maybe like produce interior accessory fashion whatever but in this strategy we wanted to create a lot of brand and a lot of you know opportunity for the artist uh, for the last slide i would love i would like to say that you know i believe that we japan and all we uh, asian has the power to change the world better um we asian already has a you know we have a historical culture that we respect each other and in this COVID situation i think the words are now divided into two but we Asian has can be a glue. So I'm I was really happy to, you know, share my experience to you and to and I also believe that we have a power to connect the world together. So thank you very much for listening to my presentation and I'm very open to discuss and I, I'm really excited to hear your advice, your opinion. So thank you so much. And Please uh, contact me through Instagram. It's Misaki Tokyo. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you, Lisette <laughs> and Mio. That was great. Uh, I guess this now is the next fun part uh, um, where we uh, do it, ask me anything. Uh, ask the two founders if you can unmute yourselves and we can. Uh, I'll, I'll kick off the first question. How about that? So everyone, <laughs> and feel free to turn on your cameras. Um, we have a pretty small group for today. Um, and usually this would be in person. So I'm guessing we would probably get to try your sweets um, and get to see some of your artwork too. And, you know, and so we're, I guess we're missing that out. Um, but I guess um, the first question, um, let's see. Uh Thinking of, um, you know, I have a bunch of questions uh, as I was uh, listening to your to your uh, presentations. Um, I guess, like, I guess this is a, a question for you both. Um, what is something uh, that people misperceive about your line of business? I know it's kind of out yeah. there. I can start. Yeah. Um, I guess. Okay, so there are like, I guess there I can think of like two things. First was um, when I was launching a business, like when I had nothing, I just had an idea. And um, like, 
So my business is a two-sided mar marketplace, right? Like it's a platform business that connects the artists to the customers. And in order to start somewhere, I needed artists, I needed artworks. And so the first thing that I did was to, um, well, I started talking to artists um, and then try to understand their struggle and like their needs and how I can solve them. And um, I like, obviously at the end of the day, I wanted someone to be um, convinced in my idea to participate on, on my platform. Um, and then a lot of them were very um, accepting of my idea and they wanted to um, participate, but some artists, especially I would say established artists who already have representation with galleries or have dealers that are working for them. They didn't like the idea and said that they were like, I was trying to commercialize the art. The art. And um, I thought it was really interesting because um, the artists who would say something like that are like, they are the ones that are almost commercial. I don't think there is anything wrong with commercializing. It's because like if you look at it from the flip side, it's about being able to make a living by selling artworks. That's what artists want. So I don't, I personally don't think that like it's just a matter of wording, but the artists who are saying that um, they are doing licensing business with, with winemakers to have their artworks on the, on the wine labels and they were making all these business agreements. It's just that they were doing it in a very subtle way um, that um, that they weren't, it didn't seem like they were kind of um, involved in the business side of it, but they definitely were. So that's something that, um, that I could think of right now. Um, another misconception about um, my business idea is that people often think that it's a rental business, a purely rental business, but it's actually rental to own business um, as rental fees go toward purchasing. Um, so we are basically trying to lower the hurdle for people who want to own art um, by starting out with rental. So, um, Alisa, do you yeah. have any? Yeah. Sorry, I couldn't get the question. Actually, so your question is about yeah, yeah. difficulties? So, sorry, I can repeat my question. Um, uh, what is something that people uh, misperceive about your line of business? What misperceive means? Like a kanjigai. Kanjigai. All right. Well, how, do you, would you like me to rephrase the question? To, no, um, I get it, but uh, okay. now I, I get the question, but now I was yeah. like, what should I answer it? <laughs> <laughs> Actually, my... I, if, yeah. Yeah, well, feel okay. free to, like, you know, you don't have to answer the question. It's an ask me anything, so, you know, if you oh, no, feel no, comfortable, no, no, don't no, worry. I, yeah. No, I would love to answer that question. Well, first of all, honestly, my business model is really simple because it's we're just, like, selling new type of sweets. So actually we didn't get so many like misunderstanding or kind of those negative, but to do actually to do in the fundraising, that was a really tough because um, a lot of startups are looking for the, for, to invest CPG brand, not the like luxury brand, because they feel that the, the CPG brand, for example, like, anything like drinks, you know, makeup or whatever, those brand, those like category, mostly uh, customer can like uh, return easily. So a lot of investors misunderstand that, that the luxury business, it's quite difficult to get the returning customer, but that is not true for us. So, uh, for example, our customer repeating rate is for over 40% every month. So it's a really, it's almost close to like a subscription model a percentage, but we are, but it's quite difficult for the ambassador to understand that reality. So that was the biggest things. But the otherwise, like, I think my business, because of the business model is super simple. So I don't think we have a difficulty to for the misunderstanding. <laughs> That's it. Make. Does it clear? 
Yo, yeah, it is. It is. Sorry, <laughs> I'm just having. I'm gonna stop screaming. Sh- 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 sorry, I just I am having some difficulties. <laughs> um. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. Thank you so much, right, and feel so free to, to uh, to ask the founders questions, each other questions. I guess that's the format for tonight. And uh, yeah. people, um, uh, you can feel free to share your cameras and ask questions. Feel free. We we it's a small group tonight. Go ahead, uh, Masa. Yes, I have um, a couple questions. Well, first of all, I I, I loved um, both presentations. Um, it was uh, kind of very different in its kind of format and and um, the way it was given. You know, one was kind of um, me. I guess yours was more. I, I felt kind of the consultant in you um, giving the presentation, and uh, Lisa, I I felt like you were like. Um, like a, a guru, <laughs> maybe like a, almost like a religious figure. <laughs> I love both both formats, but uh, I just had um, a few questions. And uh, so first, um, Mio, maybe um, I, I was just wondering, um, you know, recently NFTs have become very popular. And I was wondering, you know, if you were, you had any thoughts of putting any of the artwork um, on onto NFTs to see if that's a way for um, artists to kind of you know get some money for their the artwork. Um, yeah, um, yeah. NFT is definitely having a moment right now. Um, I'm actually, to be honest, I'm actually observing how it's playing out. Um, I'd be very interested in uh, working with digital artists. I don't necessarily think that um, non-digital, like I, I'm not really thinking about asking non-digital artists to put like make, like convert their artworks into digital so that they can sell it as NFT. But there are definitely talented digital artists who can sell their artworks as NFT. So that's where I'm interested in. Um, however, because our, um, well, I think um, there, there's definitely, it's definitely a bubble right now in terms of how much the NFT art is being valued at. I don't think NFT art will go away. Um, it's a great technology to compensate the digital artists, but I believe that it's, there's definitely a hype right now. So I'm trying yeah, to see. Yeah. I, yeah. I agree that there definitely is a hype. Um, but I also feel that um, asset securitization, there's still lots of room for that to grow. And, and for, I think art, especially art seems to be, I'm no art expert, but it just seems to be a very kind of a closed society, closed, closed world. Um, and if people can access it through, you know, um, you know, digital tokens and things like that, it just seems like there'll be more room for everybody to kind of enjoy um, yeah. the art that's out in the world. Mm-hmm, definitely. And I think like, so galleries, it's, they were trying to figure out how to work with digital artists because like, how would you monetize digital art that can be copied easily? So they were sticking with, you know, a very traditional, typical art that is like on canvas that could be sold um, that, that are tangible, but now like digital art and like maybe even music or like performative art can be sold, um, transacted. Wow. So it's very, very interesting. And I feel like there's a huge opportunity there. At the same mm-hmm. time, now like everyone can, like any digital artist can make their art into NFT. And actually art is all about curation. So like, you know, even you can sell, like some artists sell like trash as an art, right? Because if they put in some kind of meaning to it. And so for me, I'm still trying to figure out like as a platform, we need to have some kind of selection process to curate um, digital art, even if you were to start selling digital art. And I don't think right now I have a, a person with an eye to look for talented digital artists. Right. I guess, um, you know, Mako-sama, I think she wants to do something like that in um, 
New York. So maybe, okay. maybe, maybe you should try to get in contact with her and see if she can help out. Um, <laughs> maybe not today, but you know, in the future, if, if and when she moves to New York. Yeah. <laughs> because that's exactly what I think what she wants to do is like be like a curator for kind of art and museums and things like that. And I think she's even was a curator at um, the uh, museum at uh, Tokyo University. Oh, really? Yeah, I, I, I've heard I've heard she was doing that before. I didn't know. But anyways, just a thought. Oh, thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, Alyssa, I have uh, one question for you. Just it's a it's a very down to earth question, which is, um, who who makes it? How how do you make the uh, sweets? You know, do you have like um like a cake place or or some confectionery place that helps you make it? Or how how do you handle that? It's quite you. There's a quite unique story in here. Thank you so much for asking. I actually learned from YouTube. How to make it yourself. Yes. Oh, wow. <laughs> so, okay. Like right now, now we have we cooperate with Ginza Kimuraya, which is the number one. Uh, I don't know how to say it in English, but it's like, like a bread with sweet bean, like we call ampang. So now yeah. we have um, technically cooperation with uh, Ginza Kimuraya and also Puya, which has a 170 years history of sweets confectionery. But as a beginning, um, you know. I actually learned from YouTube. There's there's a big reason why I started learning from YouTube is, first of all, I was, you know, I was cooperating with a, you know, a Japanese confectionery company, mm -hmm. but I realized that it is quite difficult to do Americanize uh, because those, you know, Japanese traditional uh, craftsmen, they already have a lot of knowledge, but it's quite difficult to break their inspiration right. yeah, in right. the United States style. Right. And also at that time, you know, I was, I, you know, it is true that I was born in New York, but I went back to Japan at the age of nine and I spent 20 years in Japan. So how should I say, I don't know about the United States market. I was not you know, ready to say, to judge which sweets mm -hmm. can make buzz or not. Right now mm -hmm. I'm really okay, but as a beginning, I was not ready for that. So mm -hmm. I thought, you know, to start by myself is the quickest way to get the market needs and also adjust the market as well. So I learned, you, I learned from YouTube and I create 200 time recipe and now finally i'm really satisfied with this star right so, now so are you making the sweets like at your home or did you say like kimuraya makes it for you or no still we have a or still we we have our uh commercial kitchen in los angeles so okay. every single pieces are created in the uh, commercial kitchen we have uh, 15 employee in the kitchen right now Oh, wow. Okay. Wow. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I have to, so I can buy online. Yes, please. <laughs> <Good>. <laughs> we should whole USA and, uh, Canada, Mexico, and also include Japan as well. Oh, excellent. Wow. Well, I'll have to buy yeah. some. I'll, I'll go online yeah. and buy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, usually we hold this offline. I would be dying to try your sweets. Um, I I have a question. I, I'm I'm sorry if I'm stealing anybody's uh, questions for for now, but I want to know how did you get your collaboration with Kim Kardashian? That is a very tough. I mean, usually you have to pay. You know, like I think they're sponsor ads, right? right? And you have to pay it a lot to get to to work with them. I, I'm so curious how you got that. So uh, first of all, we actually already famous in TikTok. As you can see, mm -hmm. we have 235K follower and the accumulate video views reach to 15 million. So actually we are already well known in a uh, celebrity industrial. So one day suddenly Kim Kardashian contact us through email. It was crazy. First of all, when I saw their name, I thought it was spam. <laughs> but wow, an inbound Kim Kardashian email. Wow. 
Exactly, exactly. Well, our technique, well, actually, the Kim Kardashian's company CMO contacted us. Right. So, but again, I thought it was spam. <laughs> so I first of all searched their company uh, I, like IP address. Is it correct or not? But I finally realized it's from Kim Kardashian company. And then we, you know, talk. But anyway, so I just wanted to say that this is really lucky. But um, on the same time, to become famous in TikTok is a really important strategy, especially nowadays. It's not Instagram. TikTok is a really important strategy because a lot of people confuse that like the TikTok is for kids, but that is not true. And uh, like, for example, these days, a lot of um, uh, there are already 10, uh, 10 million people are using uh, TikTok, especially the adults are using. So if you guys are interested, you know, doing interesting in doing a new business, I totally recommend you to start doing TikTok. <laughs> wow, wow. And so do you only use TikTok exclusively? Do you do you not like use, do you also use uh, YouTube or any, because, or, or I mean, I think you said you now, you, you have some Instagram, um, Base, yeah. Right. Like customers right. Well, and, right. But right. we actually don't do not do any investment to Instagram and YouTube. It's just there. <laughs> wow. I'm sure. I'm sure you can do like a full thing on growth hack on on TikTok TikTok on how to get more more fan base and um yeah. yeah I'm open to you know tell that strategy you know if you yeah. are interested. Like um so for our TikTok we. We just started this TikTok account just a year ago. So, well, you know, actually we just, we, you know, register our TikTok account in 2019, probably like May or kind of that, you know, at that time I was just playing. I didn't know how it works. So I just registered it. And then I decided to invest to the TikTok just like 2020. Well, like march or kind of that so it's only a year to get 235k followers and as a beginning i create the niche uh, market strategy and i also co uh, create the i don't know how to say mio could you help me to translate like ne i have no idea like <laughs> Ben, I know I was gonna. I was just about to say yeah, that. Ben's, Ben's, so Ben's. Ben diagram. Eh? Ben. Ben diagram, right? And then it's like three of them. Okay, yeah. Ben diagram. Okay. Da 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 da. I become more genius. Ben diagram. Okay. So I create. I do two strategy. One is niche strategy. Then one is a Ben diagram strategy. So first of all, I for the niche strategy, I I just like contact so many influencer in a niche industry. For example, uh, I thought we have a great connection with a Wicca. I mean, it's a witch industrial. So for for a lot of you guys gonna surprise which, but in the US, which industrial is a huge market and most of the people are vegan and also they love to use, you know, crystals. Uh, because they use crystal as a, you know, fortune telling. So I thought it's a great, you know, connection with my sweets to the Wicca industrial. So uh, for the first, first months, I con contact so many Wicca influencer. And then, you know, for the human is really simple. If you see uh, three more than three times about the product, they they suddenly you know recognize. So that's why I was creating that small niche. I I tried to attack so those small niche industrial. So first month I work work with Wicca, and then second month I work with mermaid community mermaid. And then move to fairy, and then those like how do I don't know like dragon, those like fancy area. So so that is uh, like a niche and also the bentai agram 
strategy is if I work with one niche industry, I'm going to slice and I also create a lot of contact points and make it a bigger and bigger. It's super simple. But uh, lots of like company going to confuse because uh, lots of company mistake because they try to collaborate with so many ambassador or influencer, but that is not good. Like make it the like, I just say, Mata Mio chan, Tonyak Taskete. Naka, Kyoka Gikan Skutta no, Kongetsua, Sono Major Gyokai, Lai Getsua, like so you. Yeah, so like, you, yeah, like, so you, you like focus on like specific theme or like segment for each month, right? And not <laughs> spread it out as possible yeah. as you can. You had yeah. a, like a focus. Right, right. right. Yeah. yeah, that is really important. And then we move to the, then once when we be, become famous in those small niche industry, we move to more huge category like fashion or like art or vegan food or kind of that. So that that's why we could become bigger and bigger. Right. And I was, um, and so after that collaboration with Kim Kardashian, um, I'm sure she bought in a lot of uh, sales yeah. and revenue, right? Cause a lot of people follow her. Well, I mean, I follow, I think their marketing is pretty strong. And so well, like the funny yeah. thing is actually to compare the revenue from her and for our organic TikTok, right. actually, we are better than her. <laughs> wow. Wow. So yeah. nowadays, like uh, 80% of our new customer came from TikTok with no advertisement. And we com actually compared the same day which revenue is good, like TikTok or the Kim Kardashian. And actually, TikTok wins two times than the Kim Kardashian impact. Wow. We have <laughs> a, a question from Takeshi. Hello, everyone. I'm Takeshi Komanto. I used to be a New Yorker. Uh, so I used to work with uh, Masa, who's not here right now, and also uh, Naoko san, Ono san. Uh, but now I'm based in uh, Washington, DC, a boring place compared to New York. <laughs> uh, so, um, so thank you both to, uh, for great presentations. Uh, we, I learned a lot, but I have uh, some questions to Mio-san. So um, what did the investors like about your business, business ideas, business model, and to, so that you got the, the money? And also, uh, what's your next step? You're going up and down, but you want to go up again. Right. Um, yeah, so what did the investors uh, like about this business? Um, yeah, so I would say they were very, um, I think, they see the opportunity in the art market. The art market has been pretty old school, antiquated, and very slow to adapt to any kind of new changes and technology. I think it has seen um, a lot of changes in the past year in 2020 because of COVID. Um, so that COVID really forced because, I mean, the main source of uh, revenue really came from um, like art fairs mostly. So obviously the galleries couldn't participate in art fair because they were closed and galleries, most of the time they were open only by appointment. And so they were forced to go online, having online exhibitions, being able to sell online and using marketing and um, showcasing their um, pricing and making it transparent as much as possible. So that those changes happen like in a matter of you know, a few months last year. Um, so they see that the art market is, um, has been, you know, slow to adapt, but changing. And so there's a lot of, you know, we've been in, in um, we launched in 2019. So the fact that we started like building this community of artists um, before COVID and um, building this uh, foundation or customer base of a young millennial rich is, uh, I think, super intriguing for the investors. Um, and the investors themselves were um, oftentimes art collectors, so that definitely helped too. <laughs> um, 
And uh, what was the second? The second question I think was, oh, so what, what is the goal after now that we got the funding? Um, so we've been in operation. Yeah, so I, I would say in like one word, just um, exponential growth um, to get ready for series A. Um, we've been operating in New York, New Jersey, Connecticut, just the tri-state area for now, and 90% of our, of our artists are based in New York, specifically Brooklyn. Um, so as we go nationwide, we need to think about the logistics and insurance and delivery. Um, and we obviously want more artists in other states other than New York. So we need more curatorial team. And, um, and just like Alyssa, we barely, I mean, we didn't have money to invest. So we didn't spend any money on like marketing or ads. Um, so I definitely would love to spend, um, invest in like PR and marketing and as and also like branding and making our website better. Uh, thank you so much. Sorry, I need to run for another meeting. So good luck to you both. Uh, and I wish you great success. <laughs> thank you. Thank, so you. Much. thank you. Thank you. Uh, we do have another question for Mari. So yeah, thank you so much for your presentation. It's Alyssa, I um, have watched and enjoyed your TikToks and um, you know, um, I'm just, it's really cool to learn about Karina and this business model for art that I really, I wasn't aware of and will definitely be looking more into very soon. Um, but um, one question for both of you is, can you talk a little bit about what fundraising was like um, when you first started and then how it's evolved since then? Shall I start first? Okay, so I already done fundraising for angel investing, investor phase, and now we're I'm doing a seed fundraising. It's almost done. Actually, we're gonna fundraise for one million dollar, and one of the I cannot say the name right now, but you're gonna surprise with the one of the celebrity ambassadors. I hope I can like announce that name end of this year, but it's. Ah, he's so famous. <laughs> like the the hint is like Titanic, but anyway, <laughs> that's a huge hint. But anyway, I cannot tell anymore. But yeah, so for the fundraising for me, I actually had a struggle as a beginning, uh, because uh, a lot of job, a lot of first of all for the, uh, I first of all were tried to work with the United States based ambassador, but I couldn't find any good positive feedback from them because again, they thought the luxury business cannot make money quickly. It's a misunderstanding, but they, you know, they don't want it to, you know, try to invest a new category. So that was a one difficulty. And this, on the, the second difficulty for the Japanese side, uh, again, they don't understand about the food culture in the U.S., so they couldn't understand why the vegan market are becoming super grossing or gluten-free market is, you know, massing hit. They couldn't understand. So that's why it actually takes uh, uh, like a year to co correct first uh, 300k dollar from Japan. Well, like a lot of investors taught me that, oh, if you're going to do business in Japan, we were definitely going to invest you because again, I'm already successful in Japan, but a lot of, you know, Japanese investor didn't know how to judge my company. That was a one difficulty. But once when I get actually a company are already turned into black. So uh, we once when I said that information to the ambassador right now, it's super not easy, but, you know, better than the uh, fundraising in a uh, NGO uh, round. Now we already it was easily like it only takes like three months to do fundraise for one million. So it was OK. But uh, now I'm worrying about the next fundraising which is going to be series A because a lot of D2C industrial, they wanted to invest only uh, 
like a quick growth one brand, for example, Grossier or Casper or Warby Parker, they only like produce one brand. But if you see their IPOs material, it's actually, I feel it's, it's unhealthy. They were, they're always red. They, they just got a huge investment. And then finally they could do IPO, but actually they're, they're, they're not doing a healthy business. So that's why we wanted to, we, our strategy is we don't want to create only one brand. We wanted to do a multiple brand to create like, to do the risk control. But uh, I'm warned about that if, who, which, you know, VC gonna understand that strategy and which uh, ambassador can like really support this, uh, feeling that is my worry point wow so you're 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 on to create your next empire basically your your huge empire <laughs> um yeah thank you so much uh i think we have a question sorry can I oh wait uh, you i was gonna say that question so, sorry, we do have one question from another person, uh, Masa. So okay, hold on to that question um, from Naho. I think she's been patiently waiting from Nahoku san. Well, Jenny, Jenny, but Mio yeah. didn't answer that question. Oh, I'm so sorry. I thought that was for you. I'm so sorry. Okay, no, Mio, please go um, ahead. <laughs> I'm going to um, hear Nahoku's question, but um, I will just quickly go. Um, the struggles of invest, uh, fundraising. Um, I mean, like there, I would say like, you know, like you need to um, meet with the investors who are at like, we're interested in art, like some kind of interest in art. Um, if you don't, if I've met a couple of investors who have no idea about art, um, they are either um, like don't understand anything about art or like only interested in Karina because of the financial gains. And I just was not interested in talk, like either way, I, I, I was, I, I don't think it was a good fit. So, um, yeah, meeting with a correct investors with a right um, interest, I think is important. Um, one thing I would add is, um, yeah, I, 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 this was very expected, but I did have some investors who were inappropriate. Um, and uh, yeah, like I, like I listened to like all these podcasts, right? With like how I built this, um, um, and here, like rent the one we founders and stitch fix founders getting like sexually harassed and things like that. Um, so I thought I was prepared, but I, I thought it was really interesting that like, even with this me too movement, you are, um, <laughs> just so yeah, immature is all I'm going to say. <laughs> well, thank, you thank you so for much sharing for that. sharing. Yeah. And I really appreciate hearing your insights, both of you. Yeah. Um, so, sorry, uh, Nahoko-san, please. Uh, I know you've been raising your hand for a while. Please feel free to answer your question. Uh, ask the question away. Sorry, I, I'm already like in pajama, so you know I try not to show my. Um, no worries. <laughs> but um, my question, maybe like related to you know this um, last question, but um, question to Mio, with who I hopefully will meet you in person um, soon, but um, I just find out that, you know, I really thought that because like you found those like Japanese investors and then what, maybe like you explored first your business, great business in Japan first. So I thought that you were more like a very, very Japanese who cannot speak English at all. And then, you know, who doesn't know like any US culture, but you, you definitely are not. And then my question is that I believe, I mean, I talk, I tell my like colleagues, or you know, like American friends about your business. And then they were so fascinated with your business. Um, but then I wonder why you haven't really explored those US in investors like the one 
starting um, what, or Titanic or, or yeah. like, uh, or like why you haven't like really explored in the U US market yet? And um, what is yeah, uh, that's a really good question. Um, yeah, so I have been wanting to reach out to American investors and I am starting to, um, to be like, yeah, what happened was last year um, in July, my visa expired. <laughs> so I had to go back to Japan and that's when I really started to um, raise money. Um, so I was physically in Japan um, and the first investor who wrote a check for me was um, Fukutake, Mr. Fukutake from the Nase Corporation. Um, so that really opened up the path, like the door for me. Um, and it was easy for me to um, like connect with Japanese investors because um, I got the first check with, from the Nase Corporation mm -hmm. and also because I was physically in Japan. But mm -hmm. Um, now that I have um, passed, like reached the goal um, of like what I wanted to raise for the seed round, I haven't really closed, closed the round. Um, so I am still looking for investors in the US, which, um, and so I'm, I have been meeting with a few right now. Mm -hmm. And I think it is important for me to um, get funding from American investors um, because the business is based in the US. So yeah, if you, any of you in the participating uh, members, if you know anyone who might be interested, please let me know. <laughs> I'm happy to introduce like so many connections. Oh, great, thank you. I'm gonna be reaching out to you because I'm back in New York. So I'd love to meet you. Yeah, I heard about it, right, right, right. All right. Thank you, uh, Masa, please feel free to yeah, so um, I, I guess uh, just uh, one quick question I had for Alyssa was um, when you say one brand, are you talking about the um, the the sweets um, or are you talking about, is, so is that the one brand you're talking about um, and you want to be able to expand to different brands? When you say different brands, are you talking about like different brand names or like different categories, like the one you mentioned? I'm caught. Now I'm creating a different category with different brand. I see, I see, I see. But the one you have now is still the, the sweets one only. Right? Uh, so actually right now, I already have four brands right now. Oh, okay. okay. Uh, three brands is now still a little bit secret space. So once it's gonna, you know, explode, you know, bloom, I'm gonna, you know, t announce those information as well. But uh, yeah, so we already, our strategy is we wanted to create a lot of category, like really brand. And also if we create a great synergy between those brand, it's gonna be easy to share their customer together. So that is our, one of our important strategies. Yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense. Sounds, sounds good. Yes. So that's why we are now, we're now launching T brand that is already uh, we couldn't we can't say the brand name right now but we are now we have t brand and now we're preparing for some tableware brand as well I see. is this I all in-house and it's you're not collaborating with any other uh, companies right like yes. this is all in-house yes, right your own brand in our in-house wow that's that's it that's like a lot that's like a startup within a startup like that's so many like just yeah to, so that's uh, why VC don't want it to most of the VC don't want it to invest us because because it's it, too exactly they want too they, many yes they wanted the quick one brand that is like a d2c's like how to say one of the success way but again i don't feel that is healthy because to see the Casper IPO's material, it, they said it's too red, you know, if they sell one bet, they're gonna, they cannot get the, you know, uh, profit. It's, I don't think it's healthy. So that's why we wanted to create a lot of brands and make the synergy and make the strong connection. So that I, that's why I thought I can create more opportunity for a lot of artists and 
craft minds. Got it, got it. I mean, I, I'm curious to know, speaking of just uh, fundraising earlier, um, and maybe this is, is more more for me, oh, I mean, feel free to speak on for both of you guys, ladies. Um, what would you say, I mean, getting fundraising from, getting uh, checks from Japanese fund uh, investors is actually, is quite hard. And uh, I mean, in general, they're all both really hard, US and Japan and, and any, anywhere else. But um, what would you say is, uh, I mean, is the biggest differentiator you think um, when you're pitching to US investors and Japanese investors, uh, you know, what do they look for that are different um, between the two countries, the two investors? Well, like First of all, I think ja Japanese investor is way more easy, way more easy, like 10 times or 20 times easy. Because like, actually, in Japan, unfortunately, I feel the startup ecosystem is not growing enough. And there's not many player. So there's a lot of money, they're looking for a good company to invest. So I think to get the correct the money from Japan is really easy than the US. However, if, but if you're going to think about the growth strategy in the US, unfortunately, Japanese investor, mainly they don't have the connection in the US, you know, like, you know, the fundraising is important to collect money, but not only money, but also connection on or, or other support is important. So on that point, Japanese ambassadors, unfortunately, they don't have any, much connection in the US. So that's why like I, my company right now, we already fundraise for the US ambassador as well to get those connections. The, how, do, you th do you think correct, Mio? Um, yeah, I mean, I, so I actually haven't, like before talking to American investors here, right? Like I went back to Japan. So like, I can't, like, I don't have anything to like, you know, compare um, like Amer like how it is with, with like Japanese investors and American investors, um, but I will find out hopefully. Um, one thing I would say is that, so because obviously like the startup ecosystem is smaller in Japan. And so obviously is the investor ecosystem, like system, like um, investor circle or is like investor like society. Um, and so like investors are all like connected with each other. And so like if one investor in that circle, like invest in one company, like all their friends are gonna invest in that same company, um, which is kind of like what happened, like all my investors um, that are investing in Kirina are like all friends, like they all know each other. So they recommended um, rec uh, investing in Kirina, which helped. But like on the other hand, um, like if one investor says that, oh, like this is not something that I was looking for, like it doesn't really have a potential, then like that word just spreads to all the other investors. And because there are less investors in Japan, like then it just like makes it really hard for you to get any kind of investment um, within Japan. I, I felt, I, I think that that's just like my personal view. Um, and then also like, yeah, if you don't like, that's just like one angle, but like another thing I would say is that like, if you had some kind of like problem, right? It was like one investor because of like sexual harassment or something inappropriate that they said or something like that. like because that investor is connected to so many other investors in Japan, it's just gonna be really hard to connect with like the right investor because yeah, I, I thought that was like something that was maybe um, specific to Japan. Like compared to like in the US, like there are so many investors who probably don't know each other. So like, even if one investor doesn't agree with you um, or, yeah, you can e easily find other investors. Uh, yeah, that is true. It is weird, but I, I also wanted to share one sad information to hear is like 80% uh, of the women ambassador are founded by the same ambassador. And so it's, uh, how to say, unfortunately, that ambassador, I don't want to say this, but it's quite difficult to say, but 
I feel that he is, he wanted to pretend that I am good at women invest. I'm good. I'm supporting investor, investor for women, but actually he is using them, using women entrepreneurs. So, you know, that is a sad uh, information, I hope, but this is the reality. But on the same time, like the Japanese ambassador understand about that reality. So, for example, my one of my VC is ISGS. Uh, they they are super open. They don't they're super open to so many categories and so many ambassadors. So they recognize that bad things and they wanted to change. So it's a, like they're trying to change these days. It's slowly, but I feel they are trying to change that bad uh, environment. Thank you for sharing that, both of you. Uh, I'm sure it's, it's difficult either way, um, both US and Japan. Um, I think Masa, I've, I think you have another question. Yeah, I, I found the raise hand function, so sorry. <laughs> no <laughs> worries. <laughs> no, the first. Yeah, the, there uh, is a raise your hand. These really? box on, so I didn't realize people were using that and raising their hand. Sorry about that. Uh, so, so no worries. <laughs> Mia, I have a question for you, which is, if Fukutake san put in money himself, and you know, Benesse seems like they're like a big art company, right? I mean, you know, they have the Benesse Museum, right? Um, and would, isn't the company itself interested in making an investment in, in your company? And and you know, for them, you know, you know, five million dollars or ten million dollars is is nothing, right? So I was just <laughs> wondering why you just don't go to them, you know, for all the money. Why why deal with you know? institutional investors that won't understand what you're trying to do um like why don't i go to um that's the corporation itself um i not well i think like fukutake san he has like a investment fund um so he's not investing from, from i guess as like an individual investor i, I would say I okay, but it's not from Vanessa Corporation, right? No, or is it's it? It's not from Vanessa Corporation. Yeah, um, I, I would just think that Vanessa Corporation itself might have interest in that. No, is it okay yeah. to put some information in this conversation? Because, like, a lot of C, I think that Vanessa has. It is true that Vanessa has a CVC. It's a corporate venture capital, but unfortunately, uh, the full their focus is not the startup. Mainly Japanese C CBC, they cares about like a series. They starting doing negotiation from series A. Uh, the reason why they don't put the money to the uh, you know startup, I mean angel phase, it is simple because of the high risk. They don't know which company can grow. But you know that is, I think that is a Japanese culture. You know in yeah. the U.S. there's so many CBC. They already. Uh, they started investing from the injury round, but in Japan, I, I, I didn't hear a lot of information that CBC do uh, investment. Uh, they don't yeah. really invest in startups. Yeah. yeah, you may be right. Yeah, I see. For example, my company itself, we, I fundraise for one of a famous uh, TV network. He's a famous producer, and he also worked at the TV company CVC section, but again, uh, the comp the that TV show cannot invest us because our company is too small. So he decided to invest I himself. I see. Yeah, that is. I think that is a Japanese college problem. But by the way, this is a, a random question. But um, Alyssa, do you have you ever heard of or met um, Kika Hanazawa? Hmm? Hanazawa Kika. Hanazawa. Hanazawa, no? No, I'm sorry. She's she's um she's more into fashion. She has she she has her own brand, VPL, but she's li she lives in LA. Oh really? And I went to business school with her. But um she's a little bit kitsy. <laughs> <laughs> <How> <laughs> Very kitsy. So I'm not sure you would like 
like chemistry wise, you might get into a big fight with her, but she she <laughs> certainly knows, she knows a lot of people in LA and I thought she might be someone interesting that you might want to meet, but uh, you oh. know, check her out and let me know if you might want to talk with her and uh, I'm, I, I can on, kind of I, in touch. You know, come on, I'm a, uh, I spent- It'll rub off. Yes, come on, I'm too, I spent 20 years in Japan, I know, uh, I'm good at that. Come on. <laughs> I, I, I'm sure you are. I'm sure you're very good at her kindo. laugh and her sunshine will rub off. And everyone will like really tough. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much. I appreciate it. I would really love to, you know, talk to so many people. So, um, how, how, how can I connect with? Well, um, I mean, well, so let me, let me see here. We can. Um, um, if you don't want to disclose your email to your uh, to the chat here, I can send I, out I can, your. Yeah, I'm, I'm fine disclosing. I'm uh, fine as well. Okay. Um, yeah, you can write it in the chat. Uh, your email or a way yeah, to contact. I, I just put um, it at my email address. So send okay. my email yeah. No, so just in case, I'm gonna put my Facebook account here. Then it's gonna be easy. So people can connect with you. Yes. Right. I I have a question for Alyssa. Um, well, uh, you're expanding to New York City, is that correct? Yes. <laughs> and um, yeah, I mean, I wish we can, you know, once we get back off, uh, like, to hopefully normal, somewhat normal, uh, we can feature both of you ladies offline again, you know, like to do it properly, you know what I mean? It's, it's different when, um, when it's in person, right? And um, uh, so can you tell us a little bit about why you're uh, coming to New York City and when and so, yeah so first of all uh, I wanted to I think our business one of the important strategies is how to build the om omni-channel strategy uh, because we're doing luxury suites and I think the you know fortunately our company we don't put any advertisement costs for the internet but soon in the future, it is easy to imagine that we need to find about the uh, advertising on in, online and also the to think about the CSE is really expensive. On that point, uh, to having a store is a one a great way to contact with a new customer. And I was searching so many cities like San Francisco, New York, LA, but I think New York is a one of the greatest place for us because they love luxury product they also love the simple communication um my misaki itself we don't do like a pop or you know like like pop culture communication we try to create the you know luxury communication through uh, uh luxury, luxury communication so on that point like new york gonna be a one of a great fit to us and do you have an idea of when? Um, oh, actually, uh, we are now cooperating, cooperating with a one, one luxury four-star hotels in New York. So that will be your first pop-up shop over there. And it will be end of this year. And uh, we're planning to have our own shop next end of the next year. Wow, like a brick and mortar shop? Mm -hmm. Wow, congrats. Well, I will look forward to that opening when you guys so are open. Excited. <laughs> so exciting. Uh, oh, I, I didn't catch it. Where, where did you say you're going to have the brick and mortar shop? Oh, like for, we haven't, you know, doing negotiation yet, but for the first pop-up shop going to be four star hotels. So once when I, when we can launch that information, I will definitely tell to you. <laughs> great, great. So we're about and at I eight. Also a, I, I just bought now. the love love bomb. <gasps> the what? <laughs> what is it? It's it's a, it's like a box of the 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 sweets. <laughs> oh my God, Masato -san, thank you so much. <laughs> oh, you just bought her a box. Is that? Uh, yeah, is that I what you said? Box from her. <laughs> oh, just now when she was talking. Oh my gosh, I wish I'm I'm stuck in Taipei. So, but I will I will I will get to try when I get back. <laughs> Thank you very much. You know, unfortunately, we have a high volume order right now, so maybe it's gonna take like three weeks. I'm sorry. Okay, no, no problem. Thank no you. problem. 
I'll, I'll give it all to my wife and I'll, 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 I'll take a little bit for myself. Oh, <laughs> thank you so much. That's sweet. Yeah, um, me like my sweet. <laughs> I, I have been dying to try it since, uh, since we connected. Um, yeah, I mean, are there any other questions from other um, participants here? Well, I'm like, sorry, audience members. Is there any question I would like to ask to Mio, actually? Yeah. Oh, <laughs> yes. That was the whole plan, right? Yes, actually. <laughs> so Mio, so you got a lot of PR exposure. How do you get it? It's amazing. Um, you mean in the US? Yes, in of course. Country, right? Come on. Um, I was, <laughs> but yeah, that was really like purely cold emailing. <laughs> Really? Yeah, it was purely cold emailing. Like, I think we, yeah, I mean, I wish um, like we could hire a PR agency, but like last year I, I like really had no money. Like I was, you know, I wasn't paying myself. I was living in like my friend's bedroom, <laughs> um, living room, I meant. Um, yeah, so we didn't have any money to like invest in PR agency. Um, so we, um basically like cold email emailed i think like maybe 300 people and like got maybe three or four um how articles. do you get those mail address um like for example um like you would search like what i did was like search for like um like subscript because my business model is like subscription based right subscription model I would find an article on a startup that is subscription based and then find the writer. And then um, if the writer doesn't have like an email address on that media, like let's say business insider, right? Um, you try to find the, um, the, the writer's email address, but if you don't find it on business insider, you like try to find it on Instagram, Twitter, or LinkedIn. Um, yeah. And which There's, platform was really good? Instagram? Um, Instagram, because like it usually has a message function, like, you know, it has an email button where it like pops out the email for you. So you can find an email address. Um, sometimes writers or journalists have Twitter account where they have um, their email address is public. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I have we reach out to them like through LinkedIn messages, sometimes Instagram messages. Mm. Okay, I will definitely do that. <laughs> Thank you so much. Actually, I had a struggle of the PR, so that's why I was like wondering how I can like get the exposure. But okay, I'll I don't do know if my way is like efficient way to do. Uh, it's definitely not efficient. I would say that because. You're no, like, but you know, if but, you have your PR people, it's kind of cost a lot. I, I already actually, you know, do a negotiation with a new New York PR agency. They ask us ten k dollar every month. Like, yeah, um, <laughs> yeah. I have also looked into it. Like sometimes there are agencies that are like doing, you know, five thousand dollars per month for like six month commitment. Um, I still think that it's like super expensive, um, but we, we, we have the money we can put in the advertisement that's going to be more like good way to spend. Yeah. Money. Um, yeah. Like, and also like, it's not like, you know, the cheaper, the better it is, you know, like they don't really guarantee if they're going to be able to have any kind of articles, even right. if you pay them. Yeah. Which is it's an interesting system. Right. I don't think it's fair. So that's why we don't do any investment to PR. But my one of my ambassadors taught me that I should start hiring PR people because of my business model, you know. Um, but I was like, <sighs> but thank you so much. <laughs> That's great. I mean, yeah, I mean, if you are building a brand, I think PR is really important. Um, but yeah, that's one of the downsides of like, when you start, you usually have no money at the PR is so important in branding and no. well, it's incredibly expensive. I mean, one, yeah, go one, ahead. 
suggestion I would make is, um, you know, there's usually, you know, let, let's say there's, a, I, I don't know how to explain this, but, um, you know, some businesses require certain knowledge base, right? And if, you know, usually you, you have one or two of these knowledge bases, and that's why you kind of start and you're in that industry or you start that company. But, you know, not everybody has all the knowledge bases. And if you're lucky, you might have like a co-founder who has, who can help you, that complements you in, in, in understanding that knowledge base. But if there's, let's say another piece of knowledge base, like, like for example, I, I don't know if PR is how important that is to the company, but it sounds like it, it's very important. You know, maybe what you could get is like an advisor who um, will basically help you um, more on a kind of equity basis than a cash basis, right? Mm -hmm. And so they become a real partner. Um, and, you know, there, there's something in the startup world that I, I'm not too, too familiar with. Um, something called, let me just check. Um, it's like... Um, is by made by the Founder Institute, um, and it's like um, an advisory contract template. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? <laughs> yeah, I totally understand. Like the um, it, 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 it offers like a small percentage, not not yeah. like you know ten or twenty percent, just like like one percent or something like that. True, true. So that for for like some core knowledge base, it might be worth having get someone involved um, on, on, on a you know, partial equity basis. True, true. Oh, actually, my company already have two advisors, so I totally get what are you what you're talking. Uh, but, uh, you know, again, it's, you know, for the huh, PR is really unique industrial. <laughs> so it's quite yeah. difficult to find the really, really right person, you know. Right. <laughs> But right. So, no, I, yeah, I, I understand. Plus, yeah, you, know, you don't want to, you don't want to bring someone in that really doesn't fit, right? Exactly. So, so, yeah. So that's that's why it's important to make sure that this is a vesting schedule, right? So you right, don't like promise right. someone, um, like you know, whatever percent equity, and then you find out two months later you you don't really get along with that person. Yeah. But you know, and usually these contracts, you know, they they have a little bit of a cliff, right? So. Yeah. The first six months, if it doesn't work out, you guys, you know, you can say goodbye to each other and nobody's like, you know, any worse off. But, you know, um, if you do after six months, you feel that the relationship is really there, then there'd be some vesting, right? And then they would become kind of the part, part small, but part owner into the company. Mm, mm, mm. Just an idea. Yeah. Um, something that I've been considering of doing as well, so... Thank you so much for the idea. Yeah, also, um, I see that. But there's Michael a format. Do you, does everyone understand what I'm talking about? There's like a there's like an industry format and created by the Founder Institute. And it, I just can't remember what the thing was called. It's like a safe, you know, like, you know, Y Combinator safe, but it's it's for advisory contracts. If you give me a couple more minutes, I'll figure it out. <laughs> oh, thank you. It's so sweet. Yeah, Mio, you were saying? Oh, I was just saying that Michael um, just, um, he sent a message on the um, the message section about like, um, like you can find, try to get like kind of guess someone's email address if you find one um, email address, uh, which I did try myself. <laughs> so like you wanna, so why, what I would say is like, if you're gonna actually like cold email instead of like, hiring PR agency, um, it's, I would say the efficient way to do that is if you try to reach um, chief editor of a publication. So like you wanna like target like Business Insider, WWD or like um, Verge or like Refinery29, like all these like media, they each have a team section or like writer section um, where they have like the names of the editors, contributors, like chief of that, like whatever. Um, and so you wanna reach out to the chief editor, I think. 
Um, and then so like for that, you can try to guess by com like combining the first and the last name, you know, the first letter of the first name and then the last name or just the last name and the whatever. Like you can try a few combinations and figure it out. Cool, thank you. Um, and I guess, the, go ahead, go ahead. In the chat, I put in the link. It's called a FAST agreement, Founder Advisory Standard Template. And you could download the contract, you could read it and it'll, you know, it'll give you all the stuff you need to know. But basically there's kind of um, like three levels of involvement for the advisor, depending on um, what stage you're in and how much they get involved you give them any percentage from like 0 0.15 to like 1%. But it's, I think it's, you know, it's a standard template out that's out there that I, I think um, makes sense from, you know, um, the perspective of not having to spend cash yet not having to give too much equity away. Thank you. And that pretty much concludes our, um, Ask me anything. I'm going to share my screen. Uh, okay. And right now, uh, we're moving on to our community announcements. Uh, this is the part where usually we share. Uh, I know there are not that many people left in the uh, chat group, but this is usually the part where you share what you're working on or if you're hiring or, um, yeah, just about anything. Um, if, is, there, is there anyone that likes to share with us if they're hiring or what, or what they're working on? Really anything is, is fine. If not, then uh, yeah, we'll move on. Um, all right, cool. So our next uh, meeting should be in June. So that's the bi-monthly one. Um, so our, we do our events bi-monthly, so our next event is in June. Um, <clears throat> and sorry, I'm having some difficulty. And that's it. Uh, I'm going to stop sharing. How do I stop sharing? Okay. Um, yeah, thank you so much all for, for joining us. And um, it's, uh, thanks. Um, thank you for Alyssa and Mio for sharing their incredible stories and their challenges. Um, yeah, and if, if there's anyone that likes to uh, get in touch with them, I think they are, uh, they have their emails right in the chat group. We can also, um, is there an email that uh, we can send out to our, oh yeah, Mio and Alyssa both have sent their emails to the chat group. Um, yeah, so you can feel free to turn on your, your, your uh, microphones and say hello or goodbyes or <laughs> thank you are so, so much shire on on thank zoom you everybody thank, thank you, you so much you. we will see you at our next one thank you so much All right, bye. 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 bye bye thank you bye